Great, thanks. She said we're going to cover um, a supply chain deep dive. And one of the things I want to highlight is a dependency hijacking or dependency confusion vulnerability that discovered in Microsoft Teams. Um, just to talk about the software supply chain and the current gaps. Okay. Um, my name is Matt Austin. I'm the director of security research for Contrast Security. Uh, I've been doing security related stuff for about 11 years now, and then also um, been in, at a few different development shops. So I've been doing development engineering and security for about 11 years. I'm also pretty active in uh, bug bounty and things like that. And then Adam Shaw is gonna be presenting with me. Hi, uh, Adam Shaw here. I'm the director of enterprise security at Contrast. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, KernelCon, a Midwest cybersecurity conference, and uh, my local FCON group. Uh, I enjoy home labbing automation, and I have about a decade's experience uh, both making and breaking applications. And there's our Twitter handles if you'd like to follow our, follow our work or get in touch with us afterwards. So like I said, we do work at Contrast Security, and a bit of our time is focused on, or quite a bit of our research time is focused on um, software composition analysis and OSS product are, are, you know, part of what we do for the OSS product. So this has been a really interesting field of research for us and, and a really prevalent issue around the software supply chain and OSS. So today we're going to, um, we're going to cover everything, so everything about supply chain attacks and, um, and what they mean to you. Uh, first, let's, let's just break down what exactly a supply chain is. Right? It's a system of people, activities, information, and resources involved in supplying a product or service to a consumer. So um, when you think about like examples in your everyday life, uh, there's a couple that, I mean, pretty much everything you can break down into a supply chain. Uh, some of the more common ones that we broke down here, like when you get gas uh, to drive your car, you know, you... Um, you don't really think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's oil pipelines. Um, uh, they, they have to drill for the oil and dig out oil, and then they have to transport it overseas to a refinery, and the refinery you know, refines it to crude oil, and they store it in these massive tanks that then they distribute to trucks, and the trucks drive and distribute it to the gas stations. And, and, then, and then at the gas station, then you, you put it in your car, finally. You know, and, and any... Any disruption along that link can cause, you know, major issues. Uh, when you think about the food chain, uh, whether it be, um, you know, animal product or wheat or grain, uh, it, you know, it has to start somewhere, right? And in, in the example of grain, it starts from seeds. Uh, it gets farmed um, and, and it gets uh, put into grain silos and then it gets taken to a refinery and processed and, then it gets taken to your grocery store where you have to go pick it up. And then it finally arrives on your dinner table. Um, this is like a huge link, uh, you know, from A to B to C. And like I said, anything along that line can cause significant issues. Uh, one major example, devastating food shortages, at least in my case, I'm a big fan, uh, bacon prices have skyrocketed to record levels. And they might not be going down anytime soon. Um, so this is this is an example of something along the supply chain has caused bacon prices to to go through the roof, and uh, now it's harder to get bacon, uh, especially affordable bacon. So, um, but we're not just here to talk about like supply chains in general. We're really here to focus on technology supply chains and how they and how they relate to you as. Uh, industry technology experts, right? Um, and there's there's three major types of attacks and we're gonna cover each one of them in detail. Um, first, let's talk about hardware supply chain attacks. Um, this would be where modified hardware that uh, would infect the normal use of the product. Um, if you think about hardware, it's often manufactured overseas and therefore the control of the supply chain is extremely difficult. Um, you know, you have hardware in your computer your smart light bulb, your router, your dishwasher, et cetera. It goes on and on. Um, and anything along that way can really affect uh, the entire process. One of the more famous examples, um, despite the fact that this story has been mostly refuted at this point, um, in 2019, uh, Bloomberg 
published a big article where they claimed that servers purchased from a Chinese company called Supermicro contained an embedded chip on the motherboard that allowed for uh, remote execution and backdoors into those servers. Um, again, this has been mostly proven false at this point, but um, the uh, the story it tells a good supply chain story, right? Where a chip embedded on a motherboard in a manufacturing company uh, was acting erratically and able to allow people to remote into these servers. Uh, another good example, um, researcher Mike Grover of the uh, OMG cable fame, he actually created a Bitcoin stealing ledger implant. So purchased a ledger online, cracked it open and replaced uh, the SMT uh, or STM32 microcontroller with a malicious implant, packaged it back up and theoretically could go back online and sell that now. And uh, they would give him access to the, uh, the person's uh, cryptocurrency and allow him to essentially siphon off or steal that cryptocurrency at will. Um, that's another good example of a hardware supply chain attack, right? It, he, he man in the middle of the attack essentially bought it, modified it, resold it. Uh, software is another, um, uh, software supply chain attacks are also really prevalent. Uh, that's compromising the software that's used to make up an application. Uh, this is often done through open source dependencies, which bring malicious code into your target environment. So your operating system, your local services packages, uh, your deployment dependencies, your desktop applications, all of this is software on, you know, at the base level. Um, some more famous attacks recently, um, there was a cryptocurrency launch pad um, that was hit with a $3 million supply chain attack. Basically, this attacker stole $3 million in Ethereum with a single GitHub commit. Um, that commit changed the front end code to always use uh, his wallet address um, during auction exchanges. So if somebody went and they um, went and attempted to win an auction, instead of uh, sending the uh, instead of sending the person that they were um, uh, purchasing something from, it would send it to his address every time. And so he was able to steal $3 million in Ethereum doing that with a single commit. Uh, another, I mean, this is the, the most famous one probably to date. Everyone on this call has probably heard about it, but SolarWinds, uh, an IP, IT performance man monitoring tool, um, they actually pushed out an update to their own software platform that went out to all of their customers that had an obfuscated backdoor. Uh, so uh, what had happened was somebody made a malicious update to SolarWinds um, on their own environment. And then when they pushed that out, that malicious update then went to all of their clients, which is, um, you know, a, it's something that's near and de dear to my heart as um, working for a vendor, right? That, that's something that concerns us. So. Um, this is one of the more famous examples. And another uh, popular one recently uh, was Kasaya. It's a remote management tool. It, it actually hit hundreds of companies worldwide with a ransomware attack uh, once Kasaya was infected. And they used then the Kasaya's client list basically to uh, springboard and inject uh, ransomware hundreds of companies across the world. And another major type of uh, attack is side channel. So that, that's compromising some piece in a supply chain that ultimately gives attackers to the main target. Uh, when you think about that, you can think about the people who built your building, the people who bring you mail, your employees. Uh, there's lots of different ways to weasel into an environment. One of the examples that uh, I always like to talk about is this uh, target point of sale hack. Um, the attackers uh, were, they broke into the HVAC vendor for Target and, and the uh, HVAC vendor was just in to fix some refrigeration lines for Target for their, you know, those display cases. They were just fixing some display cases, uh, refrigeration lines. And uh, while they were there, uh, they plugged into their network 
and the attackers use that to pivot into target's internal network and target hosted their pos uh say their pos system on the uh on the internal network so once the attackers were in the internal network they could then uh attack and exploit the the point of sale system and uh exfil credit card information customer information um this was a huge deal it was right after black friday and so they were able to pull a ton of information uh and it all came because of uh an hvac vendor uh came in and plugged into the network uh another famous side channel supply chain attacks uh the stuxnet worm uh the stuxnet worm that brought down iranians uh, nuclear enrichment facilities was reportedly brought in through infected usb drives so the stuxnet worm was a worm created uh that spread out through the internet and uh it was just dormant until it reached a nuclear enrichment facility um and uh, even though uh iran had uh air gapped their nuclear facilities at some point uh somebody had plugged a usb drive into a computer on the public internet it was infected with stuxnet and then that person brought the usb drive into the air gap facility and plugged it in and then affected the actual facility uh which spun down centrifuges and broke all kinds of stuff um and it was just such a uh devious like way to get the um the worm inside of the facility uh was just to spread it everywhere and just hope that at some point somebody brought it into the facility and uh, this is another one that i thought was really interesting uh matt actually told me about this one uh the chinese hacking group co corrupted the compiler inside of microsoft visual studio so it was essentially a supply chain shell game because uh they were hacking the tools you used to build code and then they could theoretically add malicious code without any of the developers knowledge on you know in their own local environment so as i talk about this um one thing is clear is these are just some examples and the scope is the scope is too large for us to cover everything in 50 minutes so matt and i are going to focus specifically on software supply chain attacks Matt? That's on, you're on mute. Matt, you're on mute. Yeah, we're gonna talk about the software supply chain and how it can affect you and it can be broken down in a few different ways. Go ahead. So there's the, uh, the OS package management. When you install dependencies, so all of the depend everything you install that you need on your server, whether it's you know web server software, or mail software, or like the example to the right here, FFmpeg, uh, you're installing that one software that maybe you trust or or have some confidence in. But under the hood, that thing has a huge number of dependencies. This chart on the right is for FFmpeg and all of its dependencies, and this is actually a super simplified version of the dependencies for FFmpeg. I mean, there's a bunch of circular dependencies and then dependencies on separate versions of the same package and things like that. So the, the sprawl for an individual project or an individual software package that you need is, is um, the, the scope of it is always shockingly big and how, how much it spreads out. Um, there's also, you know, disruptions that that can happen just because of bad commits into a software project. There's an interesting example where the researchers at uh, the University of Minnesota were actually introducing intentional vulnerabilities just to test the response in, directly into things like the Linux kernel and were eventually banned from contributions. But it was just an, another interesting space you need to look at when you look at all of the when you install a package and then you look at all of its dependencies and libraries do you then also have to think that each one of those libraries also has a handful of committers and developers as part of that project so the number of developers grows exponentially with the number of libraries so that that tree that looks expansive and covers you know 100 libraries also covers 
X number of developers per library in, in many cases. So that's something we have to think about. And then, so the uh, another place to introduce is directly into your code base when, it, when you're the developer of a library or when you're the developer of that software, what are your dependencies? Uh, so this is an example from Node, which is notoriously like large in the dependency space, but uh, this Cheerio library is intended to be a, an HTML parser, which is relatively complex, but uh, this again is a simplified version of the dependency tree. Um, the full dependency tree has exactly 300 dependencies. So 300 different dependencies, 300 different projects with, with a unique set of developers in each one committing back to the project. So um, yeah, I think it's, it really just shows the sprawl of, of how complex and how, how much risk you're actually taking when you, when you use a package or, or, or um, an individual dependency. You, you might review Cheerio and think it's fine or look at it, but you really have to consider the, the vast scope of dependencies that come in. So one of the specific type of attacks that we want to talk about is, is typo squatting. And so, um, this, uh, this package is actually an example that Adam made as part of a CTF or a capture the flag. It's like a hacker game, I suppose, where you try to find vulnerabilities and, and um, get points for them and stuff. But it usually impersonates like a realistic attack. And so one of the, in the capture the flag example, this, this actually, the package that's included, instead of using the English spelling of color, it's using the, the uh, alternative UK spelling of color, and then the picker's missing an E. So it's a typo that could happen, a common typo, or a, an alternative spelling to a word. And instead of being the correct color picker, it's now the a malicious person's code that comes in. So despite the fact that this was developed for a CTF and also has really, you know, clear um, instructions about this being just for a CTF and not a real package, it still manages to get a handful of downloads, weekly downloads. Like, so it's a couple of years old, completely unmaintained, just for the CTF, actually does nothing, but uh, still has active, um, still has some number of active downloads. So realistically, you know, squatting something, uh, a more popular project or getting a typo of a really common name could have a really drastic impact. So the second thing, the second type of supply chain or software supply chain uh, that can impact dependencies is, is called dependency confusion. And so there's been some research recently um, around dependency confusion by Alex uh, Bryson. And he actually talked about um, dependency confusion versus typo squatting. So typo squatting is just mistyping the name or having similarly named things. Dependency confusion is kind of different. So inside your package managers, you can have, uh, you know, a lot of companies have public and private dependencies, you know, things that you developed in-house and things that you're that, that are private and not part of, uh, that you don't have public on the repository like Maven or NPM or anything else. And so dependency confusion works by basically putting up those private, if, if you know that a company has a private dependency, then you can actually take over, um, you can register that dependency as a public dependency. And then depending on how the, uh, either the proxy or the, uh, dependencies are pulled in, you can confuse the package manager into pulling in the public dependency instead of the internal private one. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second, but if you think about like all of the software that we talked about the software on the server and we talked about what people develop, but all of that development goes somewhere. And there's a lot of it goes to web apps, but some of it definitely goes to the desktop. And so if you think about all of the software you install on your desktop and all of it has dependencies just like these other software things. And you know, all, a lot of these use public dependencies. No one wants to write all of the 
all of the code themselves are rebuild stuff that's already built. It's a really important part of the open source lifecycle is to reuse code and share and distribute and stuff. But it definitely opens up this idea of these, like the, a possibility for these attacks. Um, at the end of the day, it's all software. It's just, it's, it's all software under the hood. All these desktop apps have, you know, this large sprawl of dependencies. Um, so we we'll talk about this uh, dependency hijacking exploit in Microsoft Teams. Um, just a quick overview, Microsoft Teams is actually an Electron app. And Electron has a web renderer uh, built on Chromium and it's built with Node.js under the hood. So you're basically just writing a web app, but you have access to Node and Node gives you system access. You can write files, read files, things like that that normally aren't available on the web. And then it packages it up into a single executable that runs and um, so it, you know, there's definitely some benefits to building an Electron app. You only have to build it once and it's it, the same code base can be shared between web and desktop. And then it's generally uh, pretty easy to be multi-platform when using it. Uh, the important thing is under the hood, it uses Node.js. And Node.js uses package manager uh, like NPM or Yarn under the, to, to, to pull in its remote dependencies. So if you, I, I was looking at the Microsoft Teams app and pulled apart its um, package.json file. So this is actually the build materials or the, the package file. And it tells it what to consume, all of the um, dependencies that should be installed. And there's a few things I wanna point out here that, uh, so for one, these are all listed as optional dependencies. And I think that's kind of important because when you do uh, an NPM install and it fails for whatever reason, like if they really needed these files, they wouldn't be optional dependencies. And some of them are optional because they're Windows only. And so the Mac build won't have them. And so if they're an optional dependency, if the dependency installation fails, um, the build won't fail. And so if there's a reason that it can't find the local um, dependency, and it, the build doesn't fail and it continues on. So if the package doesn't exist on NPM and it doesn't exist locally, then it's fine. You still have a successful build. It won't disrupt the CI process. And then the other thing I highlighted and read these um, four specific modules. So you can see on line 40 that the, that one is actually namespaced and correctly namespaced underneath the Microsoft um, namespace. The, these other four, aren't available in a public repo, but also aren't underneath the Microsoft namespace. So they're a potential target for this dependency confusion. And so to test out this theory, I created my own module called, uh, what, that was based on the name of one of the other modules, which is this MSFT WAM, uh, or WAM. And I set it to be the same version inside the package.json. So that means that anyone else doing a NPM install, like if a build server or a local developer does an NPM install and they're not connected to the proxy that's supposed to pull in the local dependency, it'll pull in, it'll try to reach out and grab it from the public repo. And so basically we're just confusing the code, this dependency confusion, we're, we're confusing the package manager into installing our malicious third-party code instead of the uh, private dependency. And so, you know, I obviously don't want to cause a disruption and I'm not modifying anything once I get to the server. So just for this test, uh, NPM has a concept of a post install script. And that just lets you write a little bit of code once it's done. Like once the install is done, does it need to clean up or do any build process? And I used that to just phone home to hit a URL so that I knew that the, a package was installed somewhere. And again, this package never existed before, so there's not other projects that might use this. You know, it's hopefully only going to happen or come from one of these Microsoft products, for example, Microsoft Teams. So I threw this thing online, and then I wait and see if anything happens. And then within a couple of hours, or within the hour, actually, I started seeing uh, a, a few installs, just these triggers that would phone home. And... Uh, I went through and looked up the IP address and they're all coming from Microsoft corporate ASNs. So they're all coming from Microsoft IP addresses. And based on comparison of ASNs, it doesn't look like it's coming from just other random Azure servers. It looks like specific corporate ASNs. So 
we don't necessarily know if it's directly coming from Microsoft Teams or if it's part of a CI or just some other process. Uh, you know, I for the proof of concept, I just wanted it to phone home. I didn't want to like pull in extra information about the server or, um, you know, I just wanted to prove that 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 it was being required. But I think we can make some assumptions and talk about like a worst case scenario. Um, and a theoretical worst case scenario would be that this is the actual Microsoft Teams build server. And there's obviously some confusion where it would normally pull in the internal repository. But if for some reason the normal, the internal repository didn't have one of these files anymore, maybe one of these was depre deprecated or this build server for some reason didn't have that local dependency. And now it's reaching out to me to pull that dependency or reaching out to NPM to pull my dependency in. And so my dependency again, just phoned home, but it's now running with this post install script on the Microsoft, on this Teams build server or whatever software it is, the build server for it. And instead of phoning home, it could maybe manipulate. So this is post check-in and right before the build is being built and packaged into software, it could do whatever it wants, right? It could start injecting new code into this build pipeline or into that already built executable. It could start before it actually does the um, executable build, it could you know, start rewriting code and you're on the build server. So it's likely signed after this step. So, you know, your code signatures, things like that, you're, you're at the step where it's putting in, you know, and injecting, potentially injecting this malicious code. And then that malicious code could then be distributed to uh, through normal auto updates uh, for Microsoft Teams out to every Teams desktop. And so, and then you could start back over, you know, is what are one of these developers, are, you know, you, you have control over all of these computers now. And, you know, one of them's a developer or some other software packets that then you can uh, distribute more. Awesome. That, that was really cool uh, to see um, live when you, when you did all that work, Matt. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about mitigations, how, how prevention and, and controls, how can we, um, you know, as industry uh, leaders prevent this type of attack. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about protecting your infrastructure. Uh, first, um, you know, we want, we recommend uh, scanning your infrastructure. Again, some of these might be best practices, but um, once you get, once you have enough of this, I think that, you know, there provides a good level of, uh, um, a good level of detection and prevention. Um, so scan your own network uh, and have a well-defined remediation process. So check for vulnerabilities, keep your server software up to date. Uh, is there something that you can do if you have a vulnerable package uh, while you await a patch um, or uh, can you scramble and get that patch up to date? Um, the well-defined remediation process is important because um, I've been at places where I can tell you if you have something vulnerable and then it waits uh, 130 days before it ever gets updated. And it's just, that's, it's a really long time. So if you, if you have a good way where you, a, a good uh, standard in place that you can push remediations through, I mean, that's, that's all the better. Uh, also on your infrastructure, use well-known package managers instead of installing directly. Uh, package managers like apt uh, are gonna provide extra protection like resource integrity by verifying signatures. Uh, they also inform and provide proper update mechanisms. So this is uh, something that's going to allow for you uh, to be better protected against um, potentially uh, a malicious um, package or something that's uh, not what you thought it was when you downloaded it. Um, I'm sure we've all heard horror stories about uh, downloading packages um, from like websites instead of uh, using a proper package manager. Uh, there's also ways to protect your SDLC. Uh, protect your deployment accounts, right? Um, enable two-factor authentication, uh, rotate your service keys, uh, create a role-based role access control on who can push artifacts. Um, this is important because uh, like that solar winds example I mentioned earlier. I mean, if there were enough controls in place around their deployment, uh, potentially could they have prevented 
um, deploying malicious code before distributing it to their to their customers and clients. Uh, you also uh, want to continuously monitor dependencies. Um, there's open source projects like Dependabot and NPM Audit. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Um, I do, I do want to uh, preface this with, um, if you are using a tool like that, make sure you understand it. Um, here's an example. Let's uh, go back to Cheerio, the node example that Matt showed you with 300 different dependencies as a developer. So as a developer, when I install Cheerio, I'm installing 300 different dependencies, uh, essentially, um, on my local machine. However, Cheerio in production only uses about 40 of those 300 packages. So um, make sure you understand what you're looking at when you are using a product like NPM Audit or Dependabot. If it's giving you a just like a ton of warnings uh, make sure that you understand which ones to address first, right? You want to address, okay, when I get this off of my machine, when I build this package for production, those are my most important dependencies, and those are the ones I need to address. So when I say use a tool like these, uh, use a tool like that, but also be mindful of like what it actually means. Um, there's also... Uh, products and services that you could use. Um, Contrast provides some of this. There's other tools and vendors, um, but the basics are you want, you want to passively detect and remediate. Uh, you want to check all of your open source software um, against a vulnerability database. And then you wanna also detect attacks and prevent exploits. Um, so you want a tool that does this and implement it in your SDLC. Uh, there's also, uh, other things that you can do uh, to help mitigate, uh, including uh, use uh, sub resource integrity checks with CDNs on your dependencies. Uh, and if we harken back to the infrastructure stuff, uh, when possible, use package managers in lieu of downloading directly. Um, popular package managers and software are Maven, MPM, uh, Gems, uh, you know, PyPy. Um, there's all kinds of great package managers out there who do attempt to do, um, you know, the best that they can with uh, um, making sure that this is the resource you think it is that you're downloading. Uh, additionally, they uh, they try to give you updates and warnings if there's actual vulnerabilities, but you're um, deploying a project that has a vulnerable library. They try to give you warnings as well. Um, lastly. Uh, I, code hygiene is very important, uh, and that that's there's like that that could be a talk in itself. But the main points are lock down your repos, enforce branch protections, role based access control on who can commit and who has you know admin rights in a repo, uh, that kind of thing, uh, and also have uh, pull request hygiene. Um, you you know some suggested standards you could have uh, you require two approvals per pull request. Um, and this is all, this has a lot to do with uh, you as a security practitioner, as an application security practitioner. Uh, what you'd want to do is create well-defined standards that your developers can adhere to, um, because after all, you're, you're trying to work with them to protect your company, right? They don't want to produce insecure code. Uh, you want them to have all the tools in place uh, to, to actually produce, you know, um, solid, good quality code. Uh, and then speaking of code, let's uh, protect that code. Um, register namespaces on public dependency managers, and then use those namespaces for internal repositories. Remember back to Matt's example uh, in where he showed the uh, four packages in a red that were, um, internal repositories didn't exist externally, but they also weren't using the at Microsoft scope. And it had they been using that namespace, Matt could not have registered them on NPM and, you know, and actually uh, had people install it, um, had Microsoft Teams install it somewhere. And uh, um, so that's, that's important. Register namespaces and then use, actually use them. Uh, 
And then also treat your dependencies as static. Use a lock file. Now, uh, there are a lot of different lock files um, when it comes to package managers. There's gem locks, there's uh, yarn.lock, there's package uh, hyphen lock.json for node. Um, these are the kind of things that it's important to you once you've evaluated a dependency, you think you think that you're okay with this dependency and its dependencies, um, that you are uh, okay bringing this into your environment and the risk is acceptable and uh, you trust it to a certain degree, lock it at that version. Here, here's why. There's all kinds of nightmares that could happen. If you say, just update whenever there's a, the latest update out there, you, you are not actually controlling um, controlling when that updates or how it updates or what the updates are. Each update, you should audit and figure out, hey, is this something that we want to bring into our code base or not? Is it necessary? Um, does it provide you know better code? Uh, is there anything malicious in here? Is there obfuscated stuff that you need to figure out what's happening? Um, because th those are all things that you want to um, that you want to approach first. Uh, and then one of the things that we also recommend is build a dependency checklist that's verified before bringing in new dependencies. Now, these are gonna be environment specific. I mean, your company is not my company, my company is not that person's company, but here are some suggested, some suggested uh, checklists. Um, is the age of the dependency consistent with your understanding of the package? Uh, for example, um, if you are installing a specific jQuery dependency, jQuery has been around forever. Um, and when you search it, there's two packages. There's one that's been around for four years with 4 million installs. And there's one that's been around for two months with uh, 30 installs. Um, make sure to lean towards the one that's that has more installs, uh, more of a history, um, and is consistent with what you expect. And then validate that that history is legitimate. Uh, again, using Matt's example, when Matt created that package on NPM, he started it at the version that Microsoft said it was at. So his first version was uh, 0.4.7, which um, is not really where you start when you're uh, versioning uh, a dependency. So there was something maybe a little suspicious there. Hey, where did the, the first four minor versions go? It didn't start at 00, it didn't start at 01, it started at 0 0.4.7. Uh, that's suspicious. Um, and then look at the uh, look at the issues um, open. If it's on GitHub, you, there's, um, or, or Bitbucket, there's a way to check what issues are open. Um, are there a lot of issues open? Are they getting closed at a regular cadence? Uh, are there security issues open? Are there a lot of security issues open? I've seen dependencies that um, they fix code stuff, but they, they weren't fixing security stuff. And it, it, it was enough to, dissu to dissuade me from using that dependency. You have some open, you have three or four open security issues that haven't been resolved and they're resolving code issues ahead of those. Uh, so that that was something that you know could dissuade you as well. Is the package actively maintained? Now this is again uh, you can come up with your own standard here, but you could say has it been worked on in the last X number of months? Um, the the key here is you don't want a package that's stale, or archived, or long term support because those are susceptible to takeovers. Um, people can take those over or they can make commits that just fly through um, without getting any real looks because the original developer has long since forgotten about these projects. Um, a lot of the open source developers often churn out hundreds of these packages. And so when they're doing all that work, um, their early stuff, they, it's pretty easy for them to forget about it. And uh, this is an interesting one right here. It's a little difficult, but does the package source code match the code on the package manager? Let me describe a scenario here. Um, so 
uh, there was a package called Event Stream. It was a JavaScript package that had 8 million weekly downloads. Uh, and it was a very popular node library uh, for managing streams. And uh, it, it um, ended up with some malicious code and attacker asked to, uh, he asked the, the, the owner if he could take it over. Again, this is something that was in long-term support. The owner, he, he had developed 600 different open source repositories. And so he said, absolutely, please take this off my hands. And uh, then the attacker um, took it. He uh, added some malicious code, uploaded that to NPM, but kept the GitHub repository clean. So if you were on NPM and you clicked through to the source code and you reviewed the source code, you wouldn't have found anything because what was on NPM was different than what was on GitHub. And you can just do that like as an attacker you don't have to, you know, maintain good change management or good change control. So you you can do that. And so um, this is difficult because you know sometimes things are transpiled, sometimes um, things have happened. But if you can verify that the source code matches the code in the package manager, you should take that extra step as well. And then lastly, ask yourself if you really need this dependency. Do you need to install it? Right. Can you code it yourself? Um, uh, one of the more famous examples here is uh, LeftPad. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to how many people remember LeftPad, but LeftPad was nine lines of code that was um, a dependency that added white space to the left of a stream. And it was um, nine lines of code that Babel uh, depended on. Now, Babel transpiles all modern JavaScript, React, Angular, Ember, um, et cetera. And uh, they, uh, um, one day, the developer who created LeftPad got angry with NPM and removed all of his packages. <laughs> LeftPad, this nine lines of something, brought down Babel and all modern JavaScript application shops at that time uh, had major disruptions. They could no longer transpile any of their code from these frameworks into vanilla JS. Uh, and it caused uh, a huge ripple effect. And the reality is um, Babel probably didn't need to have that as a dependency. <laughs> they could have written those nine lines uh, you know, in the actual transpiler and, and not, not had to worry about that. Um, and so when you, whenever I install a dependency, I always think about left pad. Is this something I can code myself in a reasonable amount of time? Does it, does it make sense to make this a dependency or can I, can I copy this in, right? Can I actually use this here uh, or, or create it myself? So these are the kind of questions that you should ask, right? And, and much of this can be automated. Tools definitely help, um, including contrast. We built many of these checks into our product. There's a whole slew of tools that would help with this. And really what the goal here is to help developers understand what they're looking for, right? You want to build security champions. And, um, and that's what's important. It's developers and in, in you, you're a team and you, you, you know, you're working together. So you're trying to build security champions and um, uh, there's a lot of great movement in this space. Um, this is something that uh, both Matt and I are excited about. Um, there's a lot of exciting new projects. Um, there's this Salsa project, um, which is sponsored by lots of great groups, including the Linux Foundation. Um, it's a security framework, basically giving everybody a common language for increasing levels of software and supply chain uh, security and integrity. I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's a really interesting read. It's uh, slsa.dev. Um, and then there's also released, what was this? Yesterday, October 1st, I think it was. So it was yeah, October 1st, the Secure Open Source or SOS Rewards. Um, and this is uh, ran by the Linux Software Foundation and uh, sponsored by the Google Open Source Security Team. But basically, 
Uh, it's a project that's going to financially reward developers for enhancing the enhancing the security of critical open source projects. So this is uh, another cool thing in the space where you're where we're essentially giving out bounties to people to fix uh, software that we all depend on, which I think is just a great um, you know is just a great uh, uh, example. Um, uh, for the industry, right? This is something that I think it has great potential. Uh, and then, and it's not just these projects and uh, and our tool and our tools and other tools. Um, this morning, I saw there was a dependency confusion tool being released at uh, Black Hat Europe, uh, the Arsenal uh, se section. Uh, so there's lots of positive movement happening in the supply chain uh, space. But thank you for your time. Um, please feel free to follow up for uh, questions. Um, Matt and I, our Twitter handles are there. Feel free to reach out. Uh, we're also, I think we have a few, t a few minutes left here. We can answer some questions. Um, we can answer some questions if they came in through the q and I I did see one that came in from uh, the Q&A and it says, can you mention, uh, such tools as an example for the checklist and like adam said there's there's the oss part of our own product that that does scoring but a lot of the other sea vendors do as well so the generally the libraries and dependencies from some of these tools like ours or sneak or, or some of these other ones will give the dependency a score and that score is based on a lot of these uh a lot of these a lot of the things in the checklist, like the age of the dependency, the, the number of open issues on GitHub and things like that. So that's it. There's, there's a few things you can automate. Some of it, obviously you can't, but I think it's important. Like there are some things that, that you, we do automatically that we come up with like a library or like a third-party dependency score. And that scoring is done by, you know, things that look suspicious. Like we'll lower the score if it started at the, the version that's super high or, inconsistent. I mean, there, there are valid reasons. Maybe it was a closed source project that's now open source. So there's a valid reason for it to have a version starting at four dot whatever. But, uh, you know, it lowers our confidence in it from just a automated review. And it just gives you something more to look at. I mean, it's not saying don't use it, but it's just saying maybe give this a second look or think about how it's getting um, how it's getting included. And so, yeah, we do that. We do uh, check out the Git repo, check out the activity on the Git repo. All of those things combined into our score. And other 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 scoring. Uh, there's different products that do different scoring, but generally, there's there are many of the items on those checklists are automated through these tooling. Awesome. And then I saw another question. I I answered it in line, but. Um... Uh, Matt and I will tweet out the slide deck. Uh, the Linux Software Foundation doesn't actually distribute those, so we'll take care of that. If you uh, check us out, uh, we'll have the slides posted soon. <laughs> Was mentioning of bacon along with the framed picture of a young pig behind Matt intentional. <laughs> Matt, I'll uh, let you take that. That was a coincidence. I, I've had the pig up for a little while, but it, you know, it fit the theme, I suppose, sadly. <laughs> Matt, Matt uh, lives in LA, so he rotates like barnyard animals and pictures behind him. <laughs> Where should someone start if they're maintaining a really old multi-million line of code application? Lots of old libraries, tools involved. Uh, yeah. that, that's a great one. Ahead, yeah, I think that's really hard. And I, I think, you know, a lot of the issues that come into play are when it's really hard to update dependencies. So if you can actively maintain and keep up to date with software, that's really important because once you're a certain number of versions behind, even if there's a known vulnerability, it's really, really hard to, um, you know, if, if the vulnerability wasn't fixed in your dependency, uh, because you're so many versions behind, it's only maintained in like the current major releases, then it's really, really hard to fix those. Um, I think that was the case with Equifax. Yeah, right? that's that's right. 
and they so there's like virtual that, patching and other things that can have that you can do you know this there's software to help you do just that like just patch in the security events or the security issues that happen um but yeah again you know there's some things to look at there's like how out of date is it what's most important for me to update i, I want to update the big core things like if my framework has an update i want to update that first and maybe not some of the you know lower level dependencies that will knock them off um so i think that's key and important and then also realize like adam talked about before that when you do an npm audit or look at all of your dependencies and the, the stretch of them you can actually evaluate your dependency and say like this is part of my build process it's important to me but it's not directly going into production so you know so many i see all the time there's like these like high severity issues that are uh denial of service vulnerabilities because of a regex but it's just in a build tool that never touches like that never has user input into your app so i think i think you can spend some time looking at all your dependencies and try to prioritize which ones are most critical to try to get up to date and then work backwards from there yeah that's uh that's the same thing i that's one of the same things i'd say here is like first figure out what like assets you have, like what exactly are you using, what reaches production, what's on development machines, and then move forward from there and, uh, you know, pick off what you can at first. But uh, I think knowing what you have is crucial in a really old multi-million line of code application. So Thank the you. other question was what trap uh, implicated in Microsoft Teams. So, it, so it's a dependency confusion vulnerability and it happened because they were, they didn't use a scoped module. So they didn't use scoped modules, which allow you to have a namespace that only your, um, only your, you can approve who can commit inside of that namespace or who can publish modules to that namespace. So they weren't using that. So that kind of opened it up for everyone. And you can take over a namespace and then use that namespace for your private installs, which is a decent idea. Even if if you don't push stuff to the public repo, if you push it under that same namespace, still it, it limits the opportunity for this confusion. So that was um, the fact that they didn't register them on the public repo kind of blankly. The fact that they weren't scoped was kind of the bigger issue. And then that I, I think it also happened to be that because they were optional, they probably weren't seeing errors for I think the reason this got installed was because maybe it wasn't used necessarily or wasn't pulled in correctly in a specific environment. If it wasn't an optional dependency, if they kind of coded around it being optional, then I think they would have had install failures and it would have been clear that like it's it's reaching out. But uh, I think the, the most correct fix in their case would be to have the scoped dependency or just just to scope all of the dependencies, you can st and still use the private repo if they want to or need to. And then they can still be optional, but there would be no way for me to take over this to scope public repos. Right, and and um, and not every like build framework is going to necessarily check external before internal, but that like happened in this case, right? So um, they had an in internal dependency that was optional, and uh, but they checked npm where Matt hosted a package and then was able to actually use that um, before, you know, um, before checking locally. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, Alex in his research, he talked a little bit about it, but um, like if a VPN is down or something, uh, now they can't reach to their internal network, then it could look out and, and that would be a problem too, so. The other thing that does help in some of these cases is, is like the package lock, because if the if the package lock should be checked into source control as well. So the developers should decide the package that they want, and then they should be pointing to the, the, the private repo. The package lock would lock you into the URL to the private repo or the location of the private repo. So in this case, it looked like they probably maybe weren't using that or whatever service this was that, that made this call wasn't using it, but the risk also happens on to the desktop user, right? Like if I bump it up one version, a, a local desktop user might be doing a clean NPM install because they aren't using the package.json or trying to update and it's pulling in mine if they're offline. So I think there's still a risk even with the package lock of attacking potentially the developers that are doing the install. 
But if the developers are, are using those package locks and, and locking in that path to the URL, then the, then the uh, deployment server or the CI environments, things like that, there's no ambiguity about where it's pulling the dependency from, and that also helps. Good question, though. Thank you. Uh, any any last minute questions? Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you again, time. everybody, for your time. Uh, Matt and I will um, will be tweeting the uh, the slide deck. Uh, appreciate it, and thank you for the Linux Software Foundation for hosting us. Uh, it's been great. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt and Adam, for your time today. And thank you to everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thank you so much.